Good afternoon and good evening. My name is Timothy Hampton. I'm the director of the Doreen B. Townsend Center for the Humanities at the University of California at Berkeley. Welcome to today's event sponsored by the center as part of our series of conversations called Remaking Sense, the Humanities and Pandemic Culture. The focus of the series is on the resources that the arts and humanities bring to the current moment as we begin to turn toward the future and think about how our culture will be rebuilt and reimagined through and after the pandemic. Before we turn to today's event, uh, let me share an announcement of coming events in the same series. Next Tuesday, December 8th uh, at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we will feature an event called Changing the Narrative on the role of narrative and the narrative imagination in the making and remaking of culture. For that event, our guests will be Catherine Gallagher, Professor Emerita of English at uh, UC Berkeley, who has written recently about the role of counterfactual narratives in literature and history, and Anthony Cascardi, Professor of Comparative Literature, Spanish and Portuguese and Rhetoric, and also the Dean of Arts and Humanities at UC Berkeley, who has written recently about the uh, 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 role of um, uh, fiction and fiction making in the history of the novel and has written widely about the uh, relationship between literature and philosophy. So that should be a fun event and I, I invite you all to tune in um, next Tuesday. Check the Townsend Center website for details. And now for today's event, our topic today is a topic that's central to the practices and values of the arts and humanities. It's also absolutely contemporary in that it is being debated in the press, in conversations all across the country, and we might even say in the streets, both in the US and around the globe. This is the question of memory, of memory and memorialization, of how we process the past, how we understand the traces of the past in the present, and how we can design a usable past that will help us move forward. Our guests today are three distinguished Berkeley humanists who have all worked extensively on these topics. Debarati Sanyal is professor of French and the author of Memory and Complicity, Migrations of Holocaust Memory, which focuses on post-war France. She's currently working on a book about migration, resistance, and aesthetics in the European migration crisis. Stephen Best is professor of English and the author of None Like Us, Blackness, Belonging, and Aesthetic Life. And Andrew Schenken is professor of architecture at Berkeley. He is currently working on a book titled The Everyday Life of Memorials. So let me welcome all three of you and thank you for being here. Our plan is to talk for about 45 minutes and then to open the floor up to questions from the audience. So if you're in the audience and have questions for our guests, as we go, feel free to use the chat function in YouTube. Your questions will reach us and our guests will respond as time permits. So let me begin by turning to you, Andy Schenken, since you're currently working on the question of memory and memorials and the everyday life of memorials. So what is the nature of memorialization? It, it seems in, in many cases to involve a kind of fixing of meaning or the kind of establ an establishment of some kind of story. Um, memorials often speak with a kind of single voice or a unified voice. But in the current moment, it seems to me that we're, at, we're being asked to make memorialization multi-voiced. In an American context, the mon monuments that have uh, told the story of exclusion or, subject, or subjecting people of cult color, and in specific black people, are being asked to tell different stories, multiple stories. So how, are we, how can we think about this at the current moment? Right. Um... Right. It, I mean, your question invites a kind of abstract answer, but there's so many concrete ways of answering it, too. And I think maybe all of us will toggle between the abstract and the specific throughout the night. But I was thinking about the question of stability or the fixity of memory. And there is something, um, you know, maddeningly unfixed about memory, personal memory, but also social memory. It's, it's malleable. And memorials seem to be a quixotic attempt to fix it. <laughs> but memorials are also almost as unstable as um, as memory itself. I, I know just recently I was looking at some 18th century accounts of Dublin and all these royalist monuments were constantly um, befouled. I mean, they were, they were treated terribly and changed and arms were broken off and, um, and then they were moved. And so um, the history of monuments is the history of very changeful objects and not just physically, right? They change according to who's looking at them. 
So I think there's an instability at the very foundation of them. And, you know, one could ask, how's that different than any piece of art? I think part of it is that they're thrown to the public and that the public is complicated. So the curation of them in public, in the public sphere is quite different than say what we do with art in, which is a little bit more stable when we put it in museums. You can take an ax to a painting, but it doesn't happen nearly so often as what happens to memorials. So, um, you know, that's my, just my first thought that there's a lack of, a, a lack of fix, you know, of, of stability with them. And this is why they're used actually, this is actually an asset so that in certain moments when, when we need them to do different things, we can make them do different things and they can start new dialogues and take on new meanings. So that's my, my first thought about it. What do you think, Ubaraki? Well, it's actually funny listening to you, Andrew. I was actually just thinking today about, um, you know, you have a monumental memory on the one hand and a mobilizing memory on the other, but I think you're absolutely right that um, these uh, memorials are incredibly unstable and they also have an incredibly volatile power in organizing public space. And I was just thinking today about um, how um, the statue of British imperialist Cecil B. Rhodes in Cape Town, um, you know, that was actually kind of dominating this campus uh, was then taken down by uh, the students, the South African students in protest of his imperialism and white supremacism. And the first thing they did actually as a student actually threw a human feces <laughs> on the statue. Um, and it's kind of a really, um, I mean, it, it's, it's really striking because it is obviously a, an incredibly uh, um, visceral <laughs> response to the power of what that monument represents. And it's also symbolic too, in that it's also protesting a structure that reduced people to human filth through filth. So um, you're talking about the mistreatment of monuments be also being part of their memorial charge um, brought that particular 2015 instance to mind. Stephen. Yeah, um, you know, I was sitting here today sort of thinking about um, uh, the, you know, the question of like um, memorialization and, and as you phrased it, the sort of shift um, from memorials seeming to speak in a single voice to um, the sort of drive to kind of make memorials multi-voiced, polyvocal, specifically as regards um, um, the status of Blacks in America. Um, and some of the touchstones um, for me are both like the kind of impromptu memorials that have um, emerged, right, um, around George Floyd, but also um, another kind of aspect of memorialization, I think it might be sort of useful to think about here. Is like, um, and again, I'm gonna, I should have, I should have, I wanted to talk about, um, uh, let's say the Woodrow Wilson School and renaming, renaming of- at Princeton, of, yeah. At Princeton, right. And, this, uh, and I, I, the, 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 I, the new name is that of, I think, is it, the, it's not the first black graduate from Princeton, but I, I, I can't, but it, it, but it essentially is the sort of replacement of Woodrow Wilson's right. name with the name of another person we right. might want to revere in history, um, which I, it's something I'd love it we, for us to talk about, which is, you know, the sort of replacement of those we no longer revere with those that we do. But just going back to that kind of question of like, what's going on in the present moment in this sort of debate and struggle around memory and memorialization, specifically around, say, the debate around Confederate monuments, Black Lives Matter, what actually is going on? And today I was sort of thinking to myself that it's not really an issue or a response to exclusion, 
right? Like a kind of additive, additive logic or a replacement logic that's motivating a lot of um, uh, uh, the sort of politics of the moment rather like I started to think about these sort of current debates um, around memory and memorialization and race in America, Black Lives Matter, Confederate monuments in the broader context of like, a, a, you know, decades long debates around reparations. I'd like, and, and, and feeling a little bit like what, what's going on that we're not quite talking about is that um, it, the, 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 the impetus is not, not, not so much to kind of replace one figure with another figure as, as Princeton has done in the case of the Woodrow Wilson School. It's more a call to kind of embrace um, America's historical complexity, right? And so, so how, how to kind of grapple with, um, how, do, how does one memorialize in a kind of context in which, um, you know, uh, uh, um, um, Thomas Jefferson is as much a part of our past as Sally Hemings. Um, the, the last slaveholder um, who's long dead is as much a part of our past as the last soldier who fought in Valley Forge. Like, how do you memorialize in that context in which both of those genealogies are part of our history? And I mean, I, I'd love for us to sort of talk about that as, as, as maybe a way in which the debate around memorialization is shifting um, in this current moment. Well, it seemed to me that Andy was suggesting that 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 it's the it's the the mutability of of monuments that makes it possible to do that. That we can precisely pop out one name and pop in another, or or uh, replace one statue with another. So there, that's one kind of mutability. But you're suggesting something else. It seems to me, right? Which is a sort of a sort of uh, multi tasking, multi-tracking process uh, as we go. So that, uh, so that, so it's not like we, we sort of stop and say, okay, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this statue for five years and then we'll take this one down and put another one in or we'll, we'll chop his arm off or we'll, or we'll paint him green, whatever. Um, but it's, it's that, that, that there has to be something that, that in order to in, engage with history, with the complexity of our history, we have to, we have to it has to be multi-voiced all the way along in some kind of way mm -hmm. so that Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings are sort of both always there. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? D-Day and Black Wall Street, right? <laughs> like how do, you sort of, how do you make a memorial right. that sort of, well, yeah, I'm sorry, go, to, uh, go ahead. No, sorry, I, I was just thinking about something that uh, Sarah Lewis observed, which she actually talks about the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial that's on the same sight lines as the Jefferson Memorial. And so spatially, they occupy the same place. And she yeah. has this really interesting remark, which is that, uh, you know, what's happening with this memorial, which is in the relationality between these two uh, memorials is uh, it kind of throws us into a different kind of time, which she calls the conditional tense, what needed to happen for these two monuments to be in the same sight line. And I thought that was a really wow. interesting way of thinking about uh, the kind of force field that you're evoking. Um, Stephen, yeah. as opposed to the additive model that somehow is voided of conflict of the conflictuality of voided the past. Voided of the conflictuality, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. this kind of pacified, happy democracy of memories that we know uh, is not happening because these memories and these tensions are being mobilized in very specific political ways. So I think that this idea of thinking about memorials that are in space through a kind of entangled time is one way of uh, complicating the additive model, pacified yeah. model of, oh, you just keep representing the minoritized and the absent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thanks for that. That is interesting. I, I the, yeah, the conditional tense, right. I was thinking about how we're talking about it. So in a sense, we're engaging and creating a, you know, a discourse about it, but others are doing it with hammers in real time, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, um, they're in that conditional tense too, which is a nice addition to our conversation, I think. And um, so there's a kind of uh, unfolding, um, a kind of unfolding present 
that gets stretched out and we don't know when we're in the past anymore. <laughs> we don't know quite what the future is. And the kind of, I guess some, some people have called it the specious present because it feels like it has endurance, but in fact, it's gone. And we haven't had time always to consider it the way we are right now at, in this moment. And it's all part of the same thing. This conversation and the hammer are related. And I think they get a little bit at what Stephen was bringing up about the multiplicity of memories that are pregnant in any moment or could be pregnant in any moment. Mm -hmm. Woodrow Wilson is an interesting figure since you brought him up. <laughs> I mean, he, he has, so the commemorative toponym of the school existed for a long time and was controversial a few years ago and finally they changed it. Yeah. But there's still, his office is still there, right? It's, it's a, almost like a period room in a museum. It's frozen in, I think, East Pine Hall. And yeah. you can go there and see the great man's office just as it was. Are they gonna mm -hmm. take that out too? And are they gonna take the slave quarters out of, yeah, I mean, they're not slave quarters anymore, but in the original building at Princeton, it's still there, right? So they can't get away from it. And it makes me think some of the fuss over commemorative toponyms over these names is facile or superficial that I think we have to reckon with it. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but it seems like it, it's, um, it's wallpaper sometimes. So I was wondering, th uh, thinking about what you were just saying in the example that uh, Debarati raised of the kind of two, two statues, um, there's also the sense in which memorials organize space around them. It's not that the memorial is, an, I mean, the memorial is an object of contemplation or a, a, an object that means something, but also everything around the memorial means in a particular kind of way. So is that something that's changing? How, how, the, how, orga, how memorials organize space in the current moment? Civic space, public space? Well, it's interesting to think about the current moment being a moment where we actually are not gathering in public civic spaces, but in fact are consuming memory through um, various media like right now. So I think that would be also an interesting thing to think about in terms of how we're experiencing the organization of space and civic life through monuments at, in a time of pandemic when we're not gathering in public spaces. I think there are connections between the two also. I think when we had our initial conversation some weeks ago, we talked about the spontaneous memorial that popped up at um, the, you know, at where the BART crosses Gillman. And um, that it was a gathering. This is in Berkeley for those. In Berkeley, who sorry, yeah. <laughs> so, but there are, there are spots like that all over the country. And there, I think we talked about how they're ageographical, but if one were to plot them, you might, you might learn something about where they're popping up. That would be an interesting project to do. But I learned about it, not from seeing it, but from seeing it on the internet <laughs> at first, and then I went to see it. And so there is a toggling again uh, between the real world and the virtual world that's happening that's interesting. And I'm not sure if there's such a thing as a civic commons that's virtual. Um, I hope there is, because that means that people are actually watching right now. That would be great. But um, but I do think that there, to get to your question, Tim, about the organization of space, I think it helps organize people and bring people to certain spaces. I, I mean, just from watching virtually people gather around these spontaneous memorials since George Floyd and in the aftermath of every other awful event that's happened, um, it does seem like people, especially now, are hungry to have some sort of real encounter with one another and that memorials are providing some sort of opportunity for that. Black Lives Matter Plaza would be one thing to kind of think about in this regard. Um, um, uh, not just the one in DC, I mean, there was one in San Francisco as well, but just how, um, um, you know, even in the pandemic, um, I haven't been to DC, but in San Francisco, um, the plaza, um, next to City Hall has become a space for people to gather. Um, there's another 
there's there's more being communicated in DC between like the mayor and the president on that plaza, but but they seem the, to be the primary kind of uh, uh, um, um, figures where that space is concerned. But yeah, it, that would be another version of like our kind of contemporary use of memorial to sort of reconstitute civic space, public space. And that's making me think, sorry. No. Stephen, that you're making me think of, I was just reading today. So the whole, the, the way in which um, the uh, space is kind of transformed into monument as we saw with uh, the, the intersection where George Floyd was killed between 38 and Chicago, which is, I guess now called um, George Floyd Plaza informally. And there's, I'm not sure where we are yet with the actual renaming. Um, um, that's also uh, a, a real kind of moment of, of a sort of seizure of space um, that in fact, I think just last night someone tried to light the memorial on fire mm. and um, the neighborhood started collecting what was left of the burned signs, signs and, and letters um, to, to kind of memorialize and create an archive mm -hmm. of this spontaneous memorial that grew out of this killing. And I think that's a really um, important and interesting moment too. So, so these are new kinds of memorialization then that are, that are emerging that are different I mean, when Stephen was talking and Andy were talking about organization of space and bringing people together, I mean, I was thinking of my own visit to, to Washington, D.C. when I was a kid, and we drove by the monuments. We, <laughs> we didn't stop and contemplate them. They were often in, in, in traffic islands in the middle of, you know, a, a, a very busy street, and you, you could kind of catch them as you went by. Um, so now we're, we're talking about something quite different, which is which is using moment spaces of memorialization as a way of sort of organizing communities and bringing communities together, possibly for other kinds of activity, other kinds of political activity or mobilization. I mean, I would add, I would sort of um, finesse that just slightly to sort of say, cause I'm listening to you, I'm reminded of a memorial that I pass on my way to campus on College Avenue, which is a memorial to George Floyd but then in like large block letters at the bottom of the memorial, it says breathe. And it, it, every time I drive past it, I'm reminded of both, you know, George Floyd, I can't breathe, but also the pandemic and be, you know, the difficulty of our, you know what I mean? Like it's a mode of communicating and being together without maybe literally being together. Like, you know what I mean? Just thinking about your experience of like, you know, driving past the, you know, whatever, if it's the Jefferson Memorial, say, versus my driving past a kind of impromptu memorial and the kind of the being together that is sort of signified by that, you know, ad hoc or impromptu right. memorial, um, the, the modes of communication that the memorial itself is trying to kind of institute. Um, I suppose that would be maybe one way of like, cutting the border between these impromptu memorializations and more civic um, state sanctioned forms of memorialization. Yeah, I would hesitate to say that they're, that they're new in how they're using space. I think impromptu memorials have always been able to requisition public space temporarily because they're temporary. Okay. They're, in fact, on College Avenue, I'm glad you brought it up, there's a memorial bench to a woman who was murdered there in about 2007, and it began as an impromptu memorial. And I just had, was passing the gathering of people who were there the next day. And I went up to them to see what they were doing. And one of the guys said, are you a friend of, I forget her name now, sadly, I can't say her name. And I said, no, I don't know her. And he waved me on because I was not part of his commemorative mm -hmm. community in that moment when it was hot, I was not allowed to be there. Mm -hmm. So that space was owned by them temporarily. And of course, with more official modes of commemoration, they'd have to go through so many committees to make that happen. <laughs> and it would never happen quite like that, right? And now that, that 
impromptu memorial, let's call it a short-term memorial, was transformed into a bench, which is more of a long-term prospect, but still not fully official the way, say, a statue might be. But I think they've always been able to requisition space temporarily because they're temporary, because they're, their status is different than a permanent one. So since you used the, the phrase, I, I could not say her name. So when we use a phrase like say her name, what is what kind of memorialization is that? I mean, that seems to be a, a, new, a new kind of practice, right? That's become extremely important in the past year. Yeah, it's performative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's performative. Um. And I think that maybe uh, digital platforms or what some people call connective memory is somehow related to the expansiveness of that performative um, memory that, that you're noting, Tim, um, the, the circulation of something like Say Her Name, not only on the street, but also online and it's kind of global diffusion. Someone pointed out that the, the woman who died on College Avenue who was murdered there is Malaya Willis Starbuck, just for the record. Thank you. Yeah. So I, so I mean, what I, one thing I'm hearing from everybody is that is that the new technologies are changing the way in which we think about memorialization, not only the way we think about memorials, about traditional memorials, statues and so on and so forth, but also just the whole process, the whole gesture of memorialization seems to be taking on new layers of meaning or new, la new possibilities through, through new technology. Is that, what I'm, is that what people are saying? I just have a small comment about that. I've been sort of thinking about it because technology means that we are kind of in some sense inhabiting this time of perpetual instantaneity which can also be because of an attention economy that's finite, uh, a, a type of perpetual amnesia. And I, I would be really curious to hear as we're, because it sounds like we're kind of shifting from uh, memory and as monument, as spatial, as sighted um, in some way to the way technology is altering what the relationship is between say connectivity and uh, collectivity. Can I say one thing to go back to say her name, like a thought I've had, I'm ha I had about that. So um, like I think about, so when I hear say her name, I think of, um, I, um, uh, what's, what was Beyonce, Beyonce, they're her original, the, she and her sisters, the Destiny's, Destiny's Child, Child of like say my name, right? So Destiny's I think, Child. okay, it's about a kind of black cultural, form of memorialization, but specifically when I said performative, I was thinking that, you know, um, you know, the, um, the, the filmmaker Arthur Jaffa really loved, he has a quote from the videographer Nam June Pak that he really loves, um, where Nam June Pak says, the culture that's going to survive in the future is the culture that you can carry around in your head. And there's something about the performance of say her, na say her name, which is like, we will carry that memory in our heads, right? It's about it's about the ways in which Black culture gets retained in like um, song, in dance, not in architectural memorials, not in like physical objects in the world, but rather through like cultural practices. And so I feel like it's like that the, the assertion say her name resonates at least on two levels, both in terms of say the specifics of like remembering Breonna Taylor but also the practice of like memorialization through song, through performance, through the handing down of like lyric tradition. Um, I, I don't know that, that it seems to be working on both of those levels to me, or I'm just reminded of the, the Nam June Pak, the culture that survive is the culture that we can carry in our heads. And speak, right? And that isn't necessarily archived in some cited, locatable, uh, isolatable way, mm -hmm. or that can't really be concretized as a thing. As a thing, right. Yeah. What's really interesting about that to me, um, Stephen, is that there's this long tradition in Western culture of citing memory practices. So if you look at Yeats's famous book, The Art of Memory, it's all about linking ideas to fictional places. You memorize the plan of a palace and you pick up the ideas as you walk in your imagination through it 
and that helps an orator give a talk. And there's a continuous tradition according to Yeats from Greece through Rome, through the Christian Middle Ages, to the early modern memory theaters. But this is a totally different way of anchoring memory in, in, um, in human action with other humans. It doesn't matter where you are. It's ageographical. Yeah. It's a totally different practice. Yeah. A geographical, not hey geographical, right? A, a, yes. A geographical. Yes. A geographical. A geographical to not be a geographical. Yeah. Yeah. So the question then is so I return to my question then. So is that a is that a cultural issue? connected, as Stephen was suggesting, to a particular tradition of, let's say, African-American culture, a diasporic culture, which has never had its own spaces, and so has had to create its culture in its head, so to speak, or is it a technological phenomenon whereby all that is solid melts into air, and we postmoderns now have to carry our culture in our heads, or at least on our, on our floppy disks, or our hard disks, or our thumb drives, because because that old tradition of building, you know, Nelson's pillar or Trajan's column is now is now gone to us or is lost to us. I mean, maybe we've lost the, the ability to be the kinds of subjects that 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 tradition of memorialization wanted us to be. Um, I would maybe cite the critic Arya Dean to respond to your. Um, your prompt and say, that's why the internet feels so black. <laughs> it's because it's because like the circulation, the, you know, the circulation <laughs> of the meme is very much like, you know, um, uh, what a good carrier for that it are are the forms of black has have been the forms of black culture. Like, you know, um, uh, yeah. Any, any, anyway, it's it, yeah. great. You're, the, you're asking the right question, but it, it's, it's because they're, they're related. It's not one but or the I, other, they're related. But I also wonder, I mean, Stephen, what you were evoking was the sort of diasporic quality mm -hmm. of, of that memory. And we are in this moment where, uh, you know, for all sorts of reasons, because of globalization and technology, we have so much of a, I mean, memory is not less, uh, I mean, is really much more uh, thought of in terms of process and motion and circulations, right? And so maybe we're also witnessing that, which is a kind of a cracking of the uh, nation as a uh, container for, for memory and a much more transnational uh, sort of sense of the circulation and interrelation of our pasts, mm -hmm. the kinds of um, entanglements that I think you were evoking both you and Andrew, uh, which isn't just about replacing one thing by another, but really kind of reckoning with a circulation that's beyond the nation state that's always kind of been operative, but that's really coming to the fore right now. And for instance, the Black Lives Matter post George Floyd's killing and the, its global diffusion is, is a real case in point here. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, you know, it makes me think somebody will propose a permanent geographically located memorial to George Floyd that's big and monumental. Someone will do that and people will put a lot of energy into it. And it's beyond me to even imagine what that would be or where it would be exactly, except where it happened. Um, but that wouldn't necessarily represent what happened very well because it's a, it's a nation shaking event. So to put it where it happened might not be the right move. And yet to put it in DC would be really controversial too and difficult. So to contemplate something like that is to, is to confront your point directly, Stephen. Like maybe it's impossible to make a monument to certain things and maybe we should think beyond the monument <laughs> and think beyond memorialization. Maybe it's a tired trope for some things. I think there are always going to be people wanting monuments and to put things in space, but that doesn't mean it's not tired, even if people are wanting, wanting it. I mean, is there I, also a, sorry, go, go ahead, Stephen. Go ahead, Tim. Well, I was just going to say that like me, yeah, what I, I guess what I'm feeling or sensing or trying to kind of articulate is a shift from, um, 
from the the place, the, um, you know, the structure from from monument to meme, like that that mm. is a way of remembering, um, and um, and that yeah yeah so so. It, that it just it's another facet or another aspect of the, the shift that Tim um, expressed at the very beginning of this conversation from the sort of single voice to the multi-voiced like how, how what what shapes does that shift take and I think say her name is a yeah it's part of a it, it's it's part of making memorialization a kind of um, subjecting it to the structure of the meme to that's the, your, the, that's the your next book. The thing that circulates. That's your next book title, from monument to meme. Monument to meme. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I you know. know. <laughs> it it does bring up something interesting. I was just thinking about this. There, there's a new statue to Mary Wollstonecraft in London, and um, it's a kind of forgettable monument. But the memes that my art history friends are putting for the threads that they're having on Facebook are completely memorable and they're much better than the statue. And I thought I should just write an article about how people are speaking in this informal mode about these monuments because it's something that's not allowed. I don't think that there's the permissiveness within uh, say an academic article typically to, to write the way they're writing. And there's a freedom with which they're, they're expressing views um, that's very meme memeish, let's say. Mm -hmm. And so there is something happening that's impossible outside of that mode of communication that is getting at memory in a, maybe a new way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can I ask a question that's slightly askew from the, where you're headed? But so I'm wondering about the placement of monuments, even old fashioned monuments, because Stephen's talking about a certain mobility and he's talking about a certain mobility of, of of memory and memorialization. One of the, the interesting question, of course, and this you were mentioning this in the context of the George Floyd, the, the inevitable George Floyd monument that will appear, is what it, where should something be? If something, if if you if you have a monument to Thomas Jefferson and you put it in Washington, DC, it may mean one thing. If you put it in Phoenix, Arizona, it may mean something quite different. And, the, and it takes on different le levels of meaning. It becomes allegorical in certain kinds of ways. New narratives are constructed around it. So I'm just wondering if one way of opening, <laughs> opening this is a kind of uh, off the wall suggestion, but one way of opening up memorials and memorialization is just to put them where they don't belong in some kind of way, always as a way of sort of giving us multi, multi, multi perspectives and multi voiced ways of talking about them. Mm. Mm of opening up the kind of univocal sense that certain kinds of certain kinds of monuments have kind of imposed on us. Mm -hmm. Seems like counterpoint, the idea of counterpuntal right. memory, yeah. like how would we organize that spatially? That would be interesting. I, I don't really know, but Edward Said talks about um, uh, a counterpuntal uh, reading of history that reconfigures center and margins and that is neither additive the way Stephen you were um, sort of questioning nor is it a kind of substitutive logic that that you were uh, evoking but you know it is about yes maybe citing some uh, a monument where it doesn't belong and creating that counterpuntal kind of force field mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so so um Time's a wasting, or time's a passing. So it's uh, it's it's five forty three, and we have a bunch of good questions. But I want to ask one question, if I could, uh, if I could indulge myself here. So um, we live in California, which seems to be a kind of non a place with no memory or a place with almost without memories or where the relationship to memory is quite different from the way it is in many other parts of the world. So are memorials in California different from the way they would be elsewhere? I mean, I know Andy, you've thought about this a bit. I'm always trying to figure out California. So I, I, I can't let this moment pass without asking about, about a California memorialization. I'm gonna to have to think about it 
before I can say anything useful. Okay. To, All right. Yeah. So we'll table that for yeah. for the next the next round of this conversation. We we, we have our share of men on horses in California. We do. We have some. <laughs> yes, we do. We do. I trust me. I'm sorry. There was one in my neighborhood in San Francisco. Okay. Fair enough. So we've got we've got some good questions, and and I'll just run through them. The first is actually a comment um, from Yvette Shalom, who who talks about the memorial to George Floyd on College Avenue, and she says it makes one pause, as as well as the one to the young woman who was killed a few years ago. It it, it makes one pause, reflect, and is also an invitation to get involved. And I think this is something that, that you you all were kind of suggesting about the ways in which new communities of of action may emerge. Um, but we have a question from Suzanne Perkins, who says, "Great discussion." Are memorials and monuments the same thing, or is there a difference? Well, I have a position. I have a position on this, but it's not probably uh, one that most people would like to hear. And it's Try that. Us. Yeah, it's that. that um, it depends on how you encounter them and on their condition. So there, are, the terms are used interchangeably often, but not always. And so there's a fluidity between the terms. Some monuments act as memorials, some are pressed into duty as memorials. Some memorials become plain civic art when they lose their communities of commemorators. Mm -hmm. So there's a, again, a fluidity. And oftentimes when committees consider whether a memorial is right for a place or not, it's a, almost a purely aesthetic decision because the commemorative aspect of it's already been decided. So they're not debating the commemoration, they're debating the aesthetics. And there is an aestheticization of it. So, and this goes back to the 19th century for sure, where it's part of uh, embellissement, uh, you know, beautification of cities. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, um, you know, because we're thinking here about memorialization in terms of monuments that, and, and the sites of memory um, in the sort of classic Pierre Nora sense. But then what Stephen brings up with the meme is a kind of a practice of memory that, I don't know, I, I work on um, sort of aesthetic literary representations where, well, for Nora, memory was just, uh, was also like a song mm -hmm. or um, I'm thinking a lot right now these days about like Albert Camus allegory of the plague and how it's become this really important cultural side of memory as we're moving through the pandemic of COVID and also at that intersection that we keep coming back to of the Floyd pandemic, right? Uh, racial injustice. So, um, so it seems as though uh, like memes or uh, literary sites of memory can be mobilizing, but then there, but it's a different way of thinking about the collective and, and coming together in space. I'm not sure. I mean, we could go to places with that, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from Alan Tansman. He says, I was wondering if you all had any thoughts about memorials that have us experience the past through our senses. Uh, he's talking, he's, he says they're Holocaust holograms, the shaking of the trenches in the Imperial Museum in London. Uh, along these lines, any thoughts about virtual reality experiencing the ter terrible events from the past? For example, there's immersive technology used by the Hiroshima uh, Peace Museum. This would suggest a whole different way of thinking about space and embodiment. Um, Thoughts about that? Yeah, but it also has me thinking about like what uh, the literary critic Ian Balcom calls sentimental identification. <laughs> like this sort of structures to kind of, you know, aid you in sort of us almost, you know, um, Adam Smithian, like putting yourself in the place of the other. Um, I don't know if I, Alan, I have more than the, that as a response, but it immediately, you know, the whole idea of a kind of um, um, haptic uh, um, reconstruction. I, I, I don't know. It, um, it, it feels a little Disney to me. Well, it's interesting. Could it just, I've been thinking about virtual reality platforms in relation to this because there are all of these, uh, 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 there are these VR experiences of Auschwitz, 
for yeah. instance. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually go into Auschwitz over your New York Times coffee and croissant. So that kind of identificatory relationship where you're consuming memory in a prosthetic way, like it becomes a part of you by virtue of your kind of experiencing it in a sensory way. And I think that, I mean, this leads us to the question also of pedagogy, you know, how do we actually teach memory in a way that isn't just like, oh, this could be me, I need to put myself on the other person's shoes, you know, uh, the way say a Schindler's List might ask us to do. Um, that I think comes back to this question of how identificatory should memory be? Um, I'm super uncomfortable with that too, like Stephen. I mean, where does it become a living museum like, um, like uh, Williamsburg, where you have happy slaves gathering food in reconstructions of buildings that aren't real at all? So there's a, you know, the idea of reenactment is obviously very troubling. I don't like that all of us are troubled by it. I'd like to take a different position, but I'm also troubled by it. <laughs> Just to create a better, you know, conversation, it would be nice to have a believer in that. But I do think that there, I do think at least since the 1990s, when, when a lot of academics turned away from vision as the dominant sense and were interested in other senses, and there was an affective turn and a turn to sensual experience, that people have been making memorials in that mode as well and have been exploring that sound and feeling and air moving and a kind of experiential mode has been a really important thing in memorial design. So uh, in that context, let me leap ahead to a question that we had from uh, Catherine Nizor. She says, do, do non-US memorial controversies offer different reflections or other ways we might memorialize that can change one's consciousness. And, and she's, so she's thinking, well, she says non-US memorial controversy, she's thinking about Berlin, yeah. where what, and which Andy, I know you've worked on a lot, where one is reminded everywhere, uh, even in the pavement of, of what has happened. I mean, do, is, is that a different, is, is, is that a different dynamic or is it the same? Different, <laughs> in a word. Okay. I think memory in, in Germany is really quite different because of the very, very thing you name. You can't, as a, uh, as um, James Young said, you can't go in anywhere in Germany without feeling the Holocaust, and that's a burden that's really different than. Um, well, actually, Americans should have a similar burden, but we don't. Um, so. Uh, they have had a kind of reckon, reckoning with their past that's uh, more mature than ours. And that doesn't make it easier to handle, but I think uh, it does make it more ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. And so we have not had our reckoning fully. It's, ha it's starting to happen. There are glimmerings, but it's not, it's not what Germany is. And I think every country has its own you know, particular flavor of this. I feel so, like the tension, though, in the kind of, Ber say, Berlin versus the United States, Holocaust versus slavery is this sort of issue of, like, ordinariness, right? Like, there's something in the, I'm, you know, the question led me to think about, oh, yes, like, the African burial ground in New York, right? Like, that, that isn't the, 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 the memorial of the African burial ground is not ordinary, every day, it, it has to kind of, it has to compete with, right, Wall Street, which is all around it. Like it has to be a memorial in that sort of um, monumental sense. Um, um, but then I also think of other um, memorial projects like Toni Morrison's um, Bench by the Side of the Road, where like she, you know, instituted a um, essentially kind of, um, a memorial project to, to fund these sort of benches along the kind of underground railroad, right? So ordinary objects, you might not even know the significance of the object um, or this, the, the, objects, the objects symbolic, right, um, value, but, but, but yeah, it's a good question. It's a really good question to think about sort of non-US, um, practices of memorialization. 
I, I wonder if, um, you know, the, cause we're, we just moved from Holocaust memory to uh, the memory of slavery. And there's something about the Holocaust where it really is the paradigm, the historical paradigm for uh, memory and human rights violations in a way that is still, um, I mean, it's interesting. There are so many uh, debates around, you know, does the universality of the Holocaust as paradigm assimilate all sorts of human rights in abuses, including slavery and colonialism? Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if that tension is at play when we're thinking about memory in the US context in and memory in say, um, Berlin. Mm -hmm. We had a question in that context. We had a question from Soraya Tlatley who wanted to know about cultures that refuse memory. Yeah, I mean, quickly, what comes to mind is a, a case study that a student of mine did. A woman named Valentina Rosas Crasa looked at Argentina, where the people refuse the apology of the state um, for the actions of the dictatorship and the people who were disappeared. And um, so they, they refuse memorials also because memorials are concretizations of these apologies. And so, so it would be where a culture doesn't wanna have a resolution because they don't think it's serious or they don't think they've come to that point emotionally um, or they think the state is disingenuous that that would, that that would be a really active way of, of taking a position. Right, it's really interesting. Um, so we had a, we have another question there, another question, and another comment, which I think are, are, are quite, uh, in, which follow up in, on, on what you've just been saying. One is a, a question from Saroz Chin, Chin Takrindi, who says, can you talk about the memorializing role of film? That that seems to be a medium that's positioned somewhere between the kind of curated museum space uh, and, and the public space of architecture. Film seems to, film seems to be crucially important for thinking about memory, at the, especially at the current moment when we think even about the, the film of George Floyd's murder. Or, or, or is, that, is that it on film? No, you know, a film that I just write, um, Debarty brought up um, um, Spielberg, right? And so that would be one use of film um, to do the work of memorialization. But um, the other filmmaker mentioned in this conversation is the filmmaker, Arthur Jaffa, who um, had a film back in 2017 called Love is the Message, the Message is Death, which was made up of all of that cell, like the cell phone footage of like violence against black people, um, you know, of which, you know, we have an abundant archive at the moment, but like that is a use of film and a use of that archival footage. I don't know if it's a mode of memorialization. I think it's, um, it's definitely film, um, implicating us as viewers in the ways in which we use these technologies to memorialize and to look or look away. Um, so it's a good question, but I think you're gonna get different answers depending upon the director or the film right. that you think is right. doing the memorialization. We could also add to, you know, we could also add Tim's suggestion to that and play that film against walls all around the country. Yeah. That, so it would be, um, again, a geographical. It would just be thrown out of context mm -hmm. because in fact, it is in every context that things like this are happening. It's ubiquitous, right? Yeah. So film could do that. And so film can also simultaneously evoke multiple histories like literature, like allegory can, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so you can actually have multiple archives of memory that are being evoked by one film. 
So we, we have one more question um, as the time is passing, which I wanted to share with you. And, and um, this is from Yvette Shalom again, who says, um, are there ways in which we can think about memorialization as a kind of transmission? And does it have any kind of capacity to build bridges across cultures? Well, I think we've, we've seen that happening just, just in the last few months, right? Um, we You're do thinking have... of, the, uh, of the George Floyd, of the way in which yes. that's gone all around the, around the world. Right, right. Or, or the meme, or, um, I mean, me memory isn't just monuments and memorials, it's, it's vectors, it's cultural vectors too, that, that are always traveling transnationally, transculturally, and these different memories are uh, speaking to each other, um, whether it's, you know, memories of colonialism, indenture, slavery, right? They, they come together in all sorts of ways in public spaces, in art. Maybe art should be the last word. That's a fantastic <laughs> final comment. Let me thank all three of you, um, Debarati Sanyal, Stephen Best, Andrew Schenken. This has been a fantastic conversation. And I wanna thank everyone uh, who tuned in and we look forward to seeing you again soon, uh, next Tuesday for our next um, Remaking Sense event, which will be on narrative. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for organizing. Thank you. Thank you.